Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining another um, Sphere Drones webinar. And I'm really looking forward to presenting this one to you all. Um, it's been a while since we last all caught up. So um, like I said, we're just going to hold up um, another minute or so and wait for a couple more attendees to join us. And then we'll be on our way in presenting um, our custom solution, water sampling with drones, and um, one that is going to be very, very exciting. So just bear with us another minute and we'll be in touch in just a moment. Cheers. Alrighty, like I said, thank you everyone for joining us today and um, really excited presenting you to present this one to you today. Um, our custom solution, the, the parasitic water sampling um, solution um, and this webinar is called Water Sampling with Drones and um, I'm really excited to have a fantastic team um, by my side today to talk through um, the below agenda and to talk more about the agenda, about Sphere Drones, um, how we've come to developing this solution from a need. Um, our design process and a touch on our custom solutions division. Um, cost savings, enhanced safety and efficiency, use cases um, of this solution, the product roadmap, and then also a bit more about uh, your questions and queries that might arise. And with regards to that, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage everyone to um, ask any questions throughout the webinar. Um, our team will do our very best to answer, and if we're unable to answer your question, we'll get to it. But um, post webinar um, and get in touch with you um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So oh, there on the right hand side of your control panel, um, you'll see there's a questions tab and I encourage everyone to ask all the questions you want. Um, so my name is Paris Kokinos, I'm the CEO and founder of Sphere Drones. I'm joined by Elliot, Elliot it's our Chief Remote Pilot. G'day Elliot. Paris, hey everyone, nice to have you with us today. Mike, check the air, thank you. Um, and I'm also um, in our presence is Guy. Um, Guy is our design engineer and our head of um, custom solutions and, and the, the brains behind the development of um, what the water sampler is. So welcome, Guy. Hey, guys. How's it going? Great. So um, that's my all-star presentation group. So um, welcome to you. Can everyone hear me? All righty, fantastic. So um, looks like everyone can hear us. Thank you very much for everyone that um, did contribute to that. So um, moving on to the next poll question. The next poll question is, what depth do you need to sample from? So if you do have a water sampling intention, um, what depth does that look like for you? Um, if it's not applicable, please answer accordingly. But I'm very interested to hear a bit more about um, what depths you're interested in sampling. Fantastic, wait for a couple more people. And again, if you're not um, in the industry or in the um, business of sampling, um, just feel free to submit not applicable and um, we'll be able to get on with the webinar. Fantastic. I'll wait for a couple more people to submit this um, poll question again. It's the, we use these polls on and really define um, the the way we approach this webinar. So all this information is fantastic. We'll close that one off. Um, next next question here is what sort of environment do you sample if you do sample? So for those that said um, not applicable, then that's fine. Um, if we can just get that um, opened up, that would be great. So this last, uh, we've got two more polls, this being um, one of them. So one more poll after this and we'll be on our way to presenting. So um, just give us a second. I've got a couple more people here. Um,
Fantastic. And thank you for everyone that submitted that poll question. We'll move, move on from there. Um, and then the last poll question until we move on. Um, so what type of liquid are you sampling? Freshwater, saltwater, tailings, dams, chemical affected water. I'm just interested in learning more about that. And of course, this feedback here is um, we are building out a bit more of a product roadmap. We've obviously developed the product here today, um, but you know, definitely interested in hearing more about um, what sort of um, facilities and um, information um, that you guys provide us so that we can constantly improve our product, which is fantastic to hear. Thank you. All righty, what we'll do is wait for one more person to submit their poll. Fantastic, thank you very much. So without further ado, we're just going to get on with um, today's webinar. So in terms of Sphere Drones and who we are, um, Sphere Drones is an end-to-end -end, um, solution provider of um, drones in an ever-evolving um, drone landscape in what, you, in what it is. So not only do we offer sales and service, but we're also there to assist in repairs and maintenance of your drones, your training, your pilot accreditation, right the way through to refresher type training, all the way through to consulting. So solutions like this are examples of what our consulting arm looks like. But on top of that, you have a look at beyond visual line of sight, extended line of sight, the new MOS, how can we assist you there? Um, we also rent solutions, so the water sample is one solution that we do rent of many solutions, um, but we do have the capability to demonstrate um, on top of that. On-site support, um, we're there to assist your drone program if you do need assistance where you need flight operations or similar, we are able to assist with us or one of our partners. And then the last thing that you see there is enterprise agreements. Now, more recently we've developed designed and developed a solution um, that manages drone programs and we're looking to uh, launch that 1st of July and um, that's something we're really, really excited about. In terms of where we're located and what our capability is, we currently got footprint in both Sydney and Perth with team members located in Melbourne and Brisbane. Um, for us as an organisation, we like to establish East Coast, West Coast mentality where we have um, team members able to service um, the country wide. Um, now, why sample drones? I'm going to hand over to Elliot, our Chief Remote Pilot, to talk a little bit more about um, why sample with drones and how this great solution has come to life. So over to you, El. Thanks, Paris. So I guess uh, most of you might already be aware of some of the benefits of, um, you know, why one might want to sample with a drone, but I guess um, just to jump straight into it, the, there are certainly a number of benefits um, over traditional methods. So um, apart from embracing technology, there's, um, you know, notable safety benefits. So, um, you know, you're reducing the hazards to personnel and property. So if you're having to send a crew out on a boat, um, you know, you're um, not having to put a person in a potential a situation where they might potentially end up overboard or, um, you know, they might get um, marooned or something like that. So you're removing people from that hazardous environment. Um, you know, if, if it's a situation where um, they're in a marine environment, that could potentially be a lot harder to rescue people from. Um, if it was in a, a dam or a treatment pond or something like that, then there could be other hazards there. Um, you've got efficiency benefits as well. So uh, traditionally, if you had to launch a boat, you might have to go out around a headland or you might have to you know, take the time to prepare that boat and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that might take numerous team members to do so. So with a drone, you can potentially operate as a single person operation. Um, you've also got a reduced turnaround time on the data as well. So if you have to, um, and sorry, when I say turnaround time on the data, I'm referring to the, the collection of and then being able to start the analysis process. Uh, traditionally, if you had to go out and launch a boat and it became an all-day operation, uh, that might take you know, 24 hours or, or say 12 hours to, to go out, collect the data, come back and get it to the lab. Um, if you can um, turn it around more quickly, then that's always a benefit, of course. Um, costs are obviously in, uh, improved uh, or reduced due to that efficiency change. Um, you can also um, cover multiple areas with the quick deployment of a UAV. So if you had a couple of different locations that you wanted to sample, um, you could certainly still sample from those different locations with the one base. Um, but trans transporting the drone from you know, A to B to C is uh, a, a pretty simple process. Um, and you know, quick pack down, quick setup at the other end, and you're good to go again. Um, reduced time for total collection of samples. So um, for example, uh, we, in our traditional, um, sorry, in our work that we've done so far, uh, usually we can collect two samples in um, 15 minutes worth of flight time. Um, 
and that includes the um, the collect flush um, ditch and you know I'll go into the process with you guys in, in a few slides time um, it's effective um, so being able to access locations that might otherwise be unsafe or inaccessible um, being able to get to sample at the bottom of a cliff for example um, close to rocky outcrops or at the bottom of marine uh, ravines or middle of dams um, or going around headlands um, if you wanted to sample on say both sides of a headland um, you don't need to physically move all the way around you might just be able to fly fly over um, i guess the other thing there as well is that um, you know, it, it also allows you to potentially capture samples in circumstances where you might not be able to sample due to say weather or um, tides or something like that. Um, if it was a situation where you might not be able to get a vehicle out there, um, say you've got a big swell or, um, you know, you wanted to sample too close to the rocky outcrops. Um, I know that, for example, if you're operating in a boat with people, you might have a policy where you, are not to get any closer than say 50 meters from um, from the cliffs or from a particular um, point. Um, accuracy is a big benefit there as well. Obviously, being able to um, you know repeatedly sample from the same location. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it on that slide. Uh, but you can see the um, the need for that system. So some of the data that um, that can be collected uh, and and analysed through water sampling techniques, uh, you know, the physical um, physical type. So you've got the temperature, the color, obviously we're not necessarily gonna be tasting it all the time, um, but you might be looking for the taste or turbidity. Um, in terms of uh, the chemical aspects of the, the water that you might be checking is the electrical conductivity. So that obviously has a relationship with the salinity of the, of the water. Um, pH, so you're looking at the acidity there. You might be looking at the contents of the water. So you might be looking for metals, phosphorus content, organic material, um, fecal content, if it was you know, near sewage pipelines, et cetera. Uh, you might be looking at the physical um, uh, debris present, so there might be sediment or pollution, microplastics, etc. So, um, you know, those might be reasons why you uh, might want to utilize a drone. Uh, sorry, why you might want to s collect samples in the first place. And, you know, those are all things that you might be able to detect using the water sampling unit. So, uh, obviously, a drone just gives it uh, the ability to be sampled from other locations. So, Um, so, and then obviously um, the, the image that you can see here on the right hand side is um, from a, a, a um, news article that um, Channel 9 News ran a little while ago. So um, our water sampling unit was utilized by Sydney Water to, uh, to do some testing off the coast of Sydney. So water quality monitoring. So some of the examples of um, applications might be things like environmental uh, monitoring. You might have health and safety, so that might be for recreational consumption. Uh, you've got agricultural applications there. You might want to make sure that your water is fit for uh, for animal consumption or for uh, um, that you're not getting um, agricultural um, runoff into your your water system. Um, you might want to make sure that your uh, for a mining application, obviously tailings, dams, etc. Uh, construction, similar kind of principle there. Um, enforcement agencies might be interested in um, checking for water quality uh, or for content of um, products inside water. Um, and then uh, industry and water management bodies, of course, might be interested in that. Uh, so just on the right hand side here as well, we've got a, um, an example of a sign that Victoria has uh, placed in some of its locations where there's blue green algae. So that obviously would uh, th that would also fall under, uh, you know, a variety of different um, applications that, that um, would need to be monitored. Um, next slide then. So I guess just to touch quickly on um, the traditional methods of sampling. So uh, I'm aware that in the past people have been uh, collecting water samples through uh, you know simply going for a walk down to the beach. Um, it might be that in some instances if uh, vehicle access to the beach was uh, difficult, soft sand, or you know, just really long stretches of beast, it might be that it's worth uh, doing that sampling with a drone. Um, if it was a situation where you were sampling from the shoreline because you didn't want to launch a boat, rather than because you were specifically interested in the shoreline aspect of the 
the data. It might be that you would benefit from um, going out past the break to collect that water sample. And again, um, that, that might be why you might want to utilize a drone. Uh, obviously, you can see there that there's a very, uh, very big shore, shore break um, dumper type wave that's about to crash on the, the gentleman running away from it. So that's obviously a, a potential hazard uh, for, uh, for water sampling purposes. Uh, sharks and debris, not a huge risk necessarily, but it's always a consideration, I suppose. And from a risk assessment point of view, you know, safety is a number one um, consideration there. Uh, I guess one thing that I haven't mentioned there is crocodiles. And, you know, for anyone in the Northern Territory or far North Queensland, I'm sure that there's uh, that's part of their risk assessment matrix. So if you can keep uh, your people away from sharks and, uh, you know, put the, put the drone in that place, um, there's potential saving of human life there. Um, and then I guess there's also just a consistency question. You know, if you're sampling from the uh, from the shoreline itself, uh, you know, I'd be asking questions about whether the uh, the the data that you're getting is is the data that you actually want. Um, so yeah. So another option for uh, traditional methods of sampling. Uh, as I've previously mentioned a little bit, you know, if you wanted to send a drone out uh, in Sydney, for example, we've got uh, Rose Bay is uh, one of our launching points, but people might have boats uh, at various points throughout Sydney's region. If uh, if you wanted to sample on the east coast of Sydney, for example, you might have to start in Botany Bay or in Rose Bay or um, further north. Um, and to access those um, those cliffs at the eastern suburbs, for example, um, would mean that you would have to launch a boat, go all the way around the headland, and um, I guess just to dial it back a little bit, you know, you have to do all the preparation of the of the boat before you launch it. Um, you've got to get the boat to site. Um, you've then got to launch the boat, which obviously all of these present uh, potential hazards as well. You've got to then transit to the sampling location, which sometimes could be a long way from the ramp. Then you actually have to physically collect the sample, return to the ramp, lo load the boat back onto the vehicle. And then this is where that blue-green algae uh, question comes into it again. Uh, if you were transiting between various sites, I know that uh, when I was a, a, a young child I remember going from going away on holidays and uh, we'd see the occasional sign that says blue green algae and it's something where you know if you've used your boat in a lake or a, a river where they do have um, you know those kind of contaminants and then you take that boat into state or um, back to a different region you can end up spreading those um, blue green algae which can be quite tough to control uh, so that's a, another potential consideration there I guess uh, on the right hand side there, that was just a um, one of the, the floating laboratories, the, um, the, the sea bound boat. Uh, on the right hand side here as well, you can see a, um, a boat that has run aground. So it's not necessarily something that occurs very often, but you know, if you had a motor failure, for example, and you were trying to sample from close to the rocks, then you could end up getting washed ashore and that could result in damage to the, the, uh, to the vessel and or people, uh, injury to people. Um, so boat sampling presents hazards. You've got, um, you know, the actual launching of the the, vo the boat itself. You've got marine environments. There's a swell consideration. Um, you've got uh, the biohazards and cross contamination that I've previously mentioned. So. Okay. So, so um, I'll hand over to Guy. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Having a look at our initial design that we developed. Um, our initial prototype design was developed based on field testing that was carried out with uh, Sydney Water. And their goal was to reduce the number of people involved and also to do, reduce the risk involved in the process. They wanted to sample one to two litres off the coast. Um, initially, we were looking at using a single pump just to collect the sample, but moved on to collecting and draining via two pumps of the system. They required uh, parasitic pumps, obviously, to um, not contaminate the sample, and also the reservoir material required was non to be non-reactive and easy to sterilise. Um, they wanted a weighted filter at the bottom of the hose. Um, initially, we utilised an interchangeable reservoir um, and a sampling depth of uh, about 50 centimetres. Um, the target sample at distances of transects of 25, 50 and 75 metres from the outfalls were also specified. Um, so having a look at the design of our initial prototype, the pumps were at the bottom. Um, this proved to be an issue because they were easily exposed to sea salt spray. Um, the electronics of this prototype were also sat exposed above the unit. Um, there were some drainage issues that we have with this reservoir because the um, red lid that you can see there sat horizontally and not vertically at the bottom um, and 
also the prototype was designed out of kind of a prototype PLA material. So having tested the system um, with Sydney Water, we determined that there, were a lot, there was a lot of value to be had in a system like this. So we decided to move forward and develop an improved iteration uh, based on the system of our initial prototype. Um, the considerations were to having closed pumps and closed electronics. We wanted the bottom drainage point to be easier and more consistent. Um, also, we wanted a, um, some sort of depth indicator so that they could tell what depth from which they were actually sampling. Um, improve the materials for our durability, of course, and we wanted to be developing this product in line with our NADA regulations. So, um, also, I encourage anyone who has any questions to jump in at any point. Um, we have having a look at the top, front, and side views of our design. We have you can see the same two pump design. However, we lifted the pumps and enclosed them to shield them from any sea salt spray. We included some air vents above as well, just to prevent any risk of overheating. Um, the vertical reservoir design, as you can see, um, allows us to easily and completely drain through the lo uh, lower nozzle on number five. Um, we opted for a semi-permanent reservoir here with the ability to easily rinse it out whilst installed. Um, and it also provided uh, us with a better center of gravity. Um, the integrated electronics we built in uh, has a XT60 connector there on number 12, and then 11 and 10 there are your uh, servo connectors for the corresponding pumps. Um, yeah, so moving on to our hose layout. Much like the version one, the hose layout of our V2 design features an inlet circuit connected to the left-hand pump and an outlet circuit connected to the right-hand pump. Um, you can see that there's an overflow valve that comes out the 0.15 meter mark there, um, just in case the sample is overflowing, it doesn't leak out of the system. Um, the main intake hose pictured on the left also features the weighted strainer to both filter debris from the water and stabilize the hose. Um, the hose is also fitted with an adjustable depth indicator flag that it should at half a meter's depth just so that the pilot uh, operating the drone is able to maintain the intended depth from which they wish to sample. Um, and as you can see here, we improved the materials quite a bit with our V2 design. The um, plastic parts we use throughout this uh, version are all um, SLS 3D printed nylon, uh, much, much more durable um, and resilient than the uh, PLA we used in version one. Um, this design also features a fair amount of um, two millimeter carbon fiber, which is much stronger and uh, allows us to maintain the payload weight, um, keep it much lighter as well. So um, just an overview of our design V2, which is designed to suit the DJI Metro 600 series. Um, obviously contact us for alternative aircraft options. This is something we're looking at at the moment. Um, it's easily removable from the uh, rail clamps that were pictured previously. Um, the payload weight on its own is 2.35 kilos, well, uh, well below the um, max capacity of the aircraft. Tank capacity is two liters and it can pump at about two liters per minute, roughly. Um, the operational weight of the full tank system with the drone is 14.5 kilos. Um, the max tested sampling height that we've gone to is three meters. That's what we recommend at the moment. Um, there's a weighted filter there and a depth indicator flag to make sure you can maintain the right sampling depth, then it gets about a 15 minute flight time. So I'm going to hand it back to Elliot for the uh, workflow process. Thanks for that guy. Uh, yeah, great overview of the system there. So uh, I guess from a workflow point of view, once you get onto site, um, you, you know, you obviously want to do a little bit of uh, reconnaissance on where you're, you're launching and landing the aircraft. But otherwise, you set up your aircraft, you do a bit of sterilization of the, the system itself, um, just for quality control purposes, of course. So um, sterilizing the sampling container first, uh, sucking some uh, alcohol and or liquid through the, uh, sorry, um, alcohol and or uh, subsequently the ionized water through the uh, through the lines, um, making sure that you're cleaning that filter, the hoses, the pumps, and uh, the, uh, the tank, so that's a pretty pretty easy thing to do. You just flick a switch um, with the uh, the filter in a jug, and then you'd give it a bit of a spray out afterwards. And yeah, that's pretty nice and easy to do. Uh, do your pre-flight checks, um, making sure that the aircraft's all ready. Obviously, uh, when you were doing your sterilization of the the system, you'd also be making sure that the uh, payload is all functioning correctly, etc. And then you're good to go. So 
Um, the next slide that we've got is about the, uh, the in-flight workflow. So essentially once the aircraft's in the air, you do a quick check of your flight controls, just make sure that the aircraft's all stable as you normally would, then heading to your sampling location. So the the neat feature of the Matrix 600, we've, I, I'm a big fan of utilizing the system with the Crystal Sky, it gives you a nice uh, readout of your distance from the um, remote controller to the uh, to the drone. You've also got uh, a, a map functionality on, on your device there so you can see exactly where the drone is. So uh, in terms of uh, getting to site, you choose your location, uh, lower the drone to a safe height, and then um, making sure that your filter is at a particular at the correct depth, you would then flick a switch and start collecting a sample. So our workflow is that we'd collect a half sample to season the canister. We'd climb up to a safe height once we've got about half a tank of uh, the, the source water or source liquid. Um, we'd give the, the aircraft gentle rock side to side, forwards and backwards, and then um, we'd, uh, that, we'd be happy that that would flush the tank. Uh, and then we'd also ditch the sample after thatwards. Um, then we would descend the aircraft again, um, collect the full sample, bring it back and land. So um, as I said before, uh, we can do that, uh, well actually I think it might be on the next slide that um, it shows that we can do that twice on one set of batteries. So as a ballpark, you'd be taking around 15 minutes to collect two full samples. Um, so after you land, uh, you do have a hose hanging down. So you do need to make sure that you don't uh, come willy nilly through a you know horizontal uh, obstacle. You don't want to get the, the sampling hose caught on anything. Uh, so essentially you would um, bring the aircraft in a little bit higher than um, than any obstacles and then lower it down vertically. Uh, I've After a couple of flights you do get the knack for coiling that um, filter and hose around itself quite nicely, um, keeping free of the, um, the legs etc. So landing the aircraft, retrieving the sample using the outlet pump. So you just have your uh, sample container, uh, sorry, your um, receptacle to put the sample into uh, underneath the outlet hose and then um, flick the switch and that'll fill up your container for you. So then after each sampling event, we did sterilize, we did flush and sterilize the tank lines just like we did at the beginning, just to make sure that you aren't potentially contaminating with it, um, previous samples, etc. Do all your post-flight checks as you normally would, and then pack down the aircraft and head on to the, the next site. And I'm sorry, I couldn't resist the pun there for quite literally rinse and repeat. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of, uh, of use cases that we just wanted to touch on quickly. So the first one that, that um, we've uh, looked at was the ocean sampling. So the big consideration there is the swell. Uh, something to bear in mind is if you have, say, um, if you have a, a half a meter swell uh, that might be five uh, 50 centimeters from the the, the average um, surface level sea surface level to the trough or the peak so if you are going descending the aircraft down into those troughs uh, in between waves uh, then you might need to climb by a meter to get out of those um, troughs when the waves come through uh, similarly when um, if you get two waves that uh, compound, you end up with a, a slightly increased wave height. And so you need to make sure that you are well clear of those troughs um, and peaks as they come through. Um, we specifically moved to a longer length, length of hose just to give us that extra separation as well. Uh, and we, in our risk assessments, we really made sure that we didn't have um, sampling taking place in, in conditions that were too extreme. Um, Otherwise, you can, you could potentially still go and do that. You just need to be a lot more careful uh, about the conditions and the speed with which you would duck down, get your sample, climb back up, and then go back down again. Uh, sam so hose length is obviously a consideration there that I mentioned. Sampling depth, uh, we've we were generally aiming for that 50 centimeter mark, so we utilise that flag, which is really handy. Wind limitations, you do need to uh, obviously you do need to consider the uh, the aircraft limitations when you're operating. The system we didn't have any any um, issues with the the drone but obviously being in a coastal environment sometimes that would pop up uh, line of sight considerations there too so if you're sampling at the bottom of the cliffs just make sure that you can still continue to see uh, keep the drone in um, that visual line of sight from both a legal and a safety point of view uh, there's also the the consideration of debris as well so if you've got any 
waves or anything that are pushing debris around under the surface that you may not be able to see, that is a potential hazard that could, uh, in a worst case, catch on your sampling hose. So uh, something to be mindful of there. Um, so we can head to the next slide. Um, if anyone does have any questions about any, anything as well, please feel free to shoot them through and um, we will get around to a, a bit of a Q&A section in a bit. Um, so freshwater sampling, we did discuss just now the uh, the ocean sampling or marine sampling where you do have a bit of a um, you know tides or, or wave um, action. Just a um, quick tidbit on the the wave um, side of things. The we haven't tested the system in in uh, white water situations. So from a, a um, from a beachfront sampling point of view, just bear in mind that if you do have um, a huge pull on the uh, the uh, hose um, that it could potentially affect the the aircraft stability so that does apply to freshwater sampling as well particularly if you're sampling in running water say you've got a um, you know I remember seeing flood waters in Brisbane years ago and some of the debris that was floating along there were you know water tanks and um, boats and barges and all that kind of stuff floating along underneath the on the top of but it's also underneath the surface and so just be mindful of that um, the, the depth as well. So if you're sampling from running water and you're aiming for a particular depth, you need to bear in mind that um, there may be an angle associated with any current that is pulling the, um, the sampling hose a particular direction. Uh, you'd also, regardless of uh, your use case, you do need to be mindful of the terrain, but obviously a, a drone is pretty useful when it comes to uh, sampling from you know, the tops, like if you want to sample from the bottom of a gorge, cliff, or you need to go around particular obstacles, and that's always handy. Um, cool, so I think we've got one more use case here. So uh, we've got a, uh, a tailings dam application, so I guess after uh, mining sites are, are done with their um, their water for, uh, from their processing um, procedures, they will often put it into a tailings dam or it might be at the end of uh, the operation of a drone, they might be able to leave a pit uh, unfilled. Uh, those bodies of water that might be collecting um, minerals, etc., cetera, from um, the, those processes might need to be tested. So I guess being able to stand at the top of those pits or um, away from those tailings dams uh, just really improves that safety use case there. Something to be mindful of is the terrain and then also uh, the characteristics of the liquid. So if you had a, a substance that was particularly acidic or particularly caustic or something like that, then um, you just need to make sure that you take all the, the appropriate precautions. Uh, it's a similar principle, I suppose, to the water sampling that you'd be doing um, manually anyway if you were to be doing that with you know by hand or by boat or something like that then you'd likely have those kinds of things uh, built into your kind of standard operating procedures anyway. So I'll hand back to Guy now for the uh, the bit of a insight to the product roadmap. Guy in Paris. Um, yeah, yeah so Paris, the first well, thing do you want to take it Paris? No, I'm happy for you to take lead, mate. Okay, well, good. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that we're looking at is um, multi-platform integrations, I guess, just so we could integrate this onto other drones. I know that maybe the N600 isn't something that's suitable for everyone, so we want to be able to make sure that we cover all our bases there. Um, depth sampling is also something we've been looking at for some time, and we're looking at sampling at greater depths, you know, 10 metres plus kind of thing. At the moment, we're only sampling from about 50 centimetre depth, so I think that'll open up a lot of different use cases for this product. And another thing finally that we're looking at is um, live analytics. So being able to analyze the quality and uh, features of the sample from the aircraft itself. Um, for example, you know, getting live pH data um, coming from the system uh, on the spot. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And I guess a, a lot of what we're driving for at the moment is customer feedback and um, insights as to, um, you know, opportunities of, adding things to the roadmap. So we already have had today um, some very interesting um, insights from some of our customers. I know there's a customer requesting, is there an emergency release for the hose if it potentially gets caught in an obstacle? Now, that's something, for example, we would throw straight into our product roadmap and our product improvement roadmap. Another one was, is there a, um, a float available um, rather than a flag? So, you know, those sort of, uh, those sort of things, those sort of insights are things that we will consider moving forward in the future. But um, in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, I, we're just interested to see if there would be anyone interested in a um, demonstration of the solution. And this is a bit more of a poll question to just see the sort of audience that we've got and whether they'd be interested in a demonstration of our solution now. Um, yeah, I'll just see what sort of traction we've got there. 
again, throughout this webinar, I'd be definitely interested in, um, I'd definitely be interested in having um, some more questions answered. I think this is nearing the end of our presentation. We wanted to keep it short and sharp um, for the audience and be able to answer those questions. So um, we'll just wait for a couple more people to submit their poll questions here and um, we'll, we'll get on to a couple more of the, um, the questions that have come out of this. I guess Elliot and um, guys, anything else you wanted to add um, to this? Not particularly at the moment. I mean, if anyone has any questions um, that they that they think of after the fact as well, we'd of course welcome them. Uh, I guess any further insight that you have into you know ways that we can tailor this system to to suit another application is always um, beneficial for everyone. Uh, I guess the 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 one caveat that I did want to um, insert here is that I, um, I'm a, a drone guy rather than a water sampling guy and my, my limited scientific experience at university has um, only covered some elements of um, basic scientific stuff so um, obviously if there's anything that anyone wanted to add um, from a, an audience side of things to, to let us know that they wanted to see a particular you know change um, to the workflow or anything like that to, to better suit them then then we'd be um, receptive to that. One thing that we did discuss briefly is the NADA accreditation and um, you know the the guidelines that NADA has in place uh, to to make sure that that data's um, integrity is kept intact. Um, so yeah, that's that's all from me, I suppose. Fantastic, thanks, Elliot. And um, yeah, like we said earlier, we do encourage questions, um, and now's the time to ask those questions. So we will get onto those questions now. Um, so. A answering the, the depths at which we've sampled, Elliot. So I believe from memory, um, when we were on site, we sampled at half metre depths, is that correct? But have we, we sampled deeper than that right at this point in time? And what, I guess, what is the potential of depth we can sample? So will the hose, uh, a hose being three metres, obviously it just depends how game you are to put your drone um, particularly close to the surface of the water. Um, the pumps we've tested uh, with that three meter hose, we haven't had any dramas at all. Um, so it's just a matter of, um, you know, test. like I, I think probably if you have a particular use case where you want to see a, a particular depth sampled, um, get in touch and we can, you know, see what that looks like. Um, but off the, off the bat, um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't sample from as, as deep as, you know, two and a half to, 2.75 meters with this system stock as it is, but if you wanted to try out a longer hose, it might just be that you see a slightly reduced sampling um, speed. Um, those pumps might have to work a little bit harder and you might find that you only get, maybe you only get one set of samples out of a battery instead of two, or maybe it just takes you a little bit longer to get those samples, so. Yeah, fantastic, thanks, El. Um, and uh, the Guy, there was a question about, um, about um, using the auxiliary power on the system. Can you talk a little bit more about how the, the actual unit is powered? Yeah, so I mean, the power comes from the power distribution board from the drone. I think the power was to do with the draw comparing to DJI's rating. So it comes in at about two and a half amps to the limit of 10 from the DJI system, I believe. So yeah, it comes in well under there. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, thanks Guy. And, and as Guy has mentioned, we are using the auxiliary um, power output there on the bottom of the Matri 600 unit. So um, quite easily a plug and play um, solution for the Matri 600. Um, Elliot, you might be able to answer this one, but um, surrounding purchase price um, and um, rental costs, if that's something you don't have now, we can definitely reach back to those um, customers. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the price of the water sampling unit, I believe it sits at around the four and a half, five thousand dollar mark as a ballpark. Yeah, um, there's, thank you, guy. Uh, so in terms of the, if you have an M600 already, then uh, that system becomes a plug and play almost solution for your M600. If you don't have a Matrice um, or other drone platform already, um, then we could assist with an M600 or equivalent aircraft. As Guy mentioned, uh, the system is potentially compatible with other platforms as well. So if you particularly wanted to use um, a different type, that should be doable. It's just a matter of if there's any costs associated with making those slight changes. Um, I guess uh, from a, an aircraft point of view, the M600 as a ballpark sits at around the $10,000 mark um, for just the aircraft and then uh, you want to get additional extras like batteries and cases, um, cameras, you might want to end up um, getting a secondary remote controller or something like that. So um, yeah, 
was there anything else that you wanted to add there, Paris? No, um, as as Elliot mentioned, we we able to rent and hire um, the the drone and the um, the water solution um, to you and your operation. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward um, to set up. Now, El, we've got another great question that's come through, and it's it's specifically around an indicative time um, to set up from pulling up in a vehicle to you know flying um, with the solution, and what the turnaround time of that looks like. And um, yeah, if you could provide more of an insight there, just some sort of indicative timings? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I must confess, I don't know if I ever actually specifically um, used the uh, the old stopwatch to, to see how long it took. But look, if you if you aren't familiar with the M600, it's a pretty easy aircraft to, to utilize. Um, in terms of setup, the payload can live on the drone. So when you arrive on the site, you can just take the, the drone out of the box. You don't need to do any particularly um, uh, time-consuming setup there. Um, if you if you did want to transport the water sampling system separately, then it would only be plugging in those three um, three cords and screwing in four screws to um, secure that thing to the drone. Um, but look, long story short, um, I suppose you'd probably be looking at maybe. I guess five to 10 minutes maybe at most to get all set up and everything. Uh, I guess the most um, time consuming part is just um, doing a little bit of uh, sterilization on those tanks. Um, but I mean, really it's it's pretty quick and easy to deploy in my opinion, uh, particularly if just as a, a bit of um, pro tip, I suppose, if you guys go down the road of, um, of procuring an M600 and all the bells and whistles, um, I would recommend that you guys do um, get yourself a set of caster wheels for the base of your Matrice 600 case. Um, it does make life a lot easier. Um, we in the past had to utilize a, um, a trolley to move the M600 case and just having it on a set of casters is really, really convenient. Thank you very much, El. And um, Guy, probably a question for you, but interchanging tanks, um, is that a challenge? How easy is it? How long will it take? Um, so interchanging the tanks, uh, we set it to semi-permanent design. I mean, the only thing you really need to do is to unscrew the four screws on the bottom plate, the bottom carbon fibre plate. Um, after doing that, you just have to detach the two hoses on the top and it slides out the bottom. So um, all in all, if you wanted to take the tank out and put another one in, it'd probably take about five minutes, I'd say. It's not the hardest thing to do. Um, you just have to make sure that you have spare hose available to do that. Yeah, fantastic. And obviously these additional accessories and parts are things that um, we, we can and will supply um, if if that is of interest. Now, um, it looks as though we've gone through the, all the questions. Actually, hang on, here we go. Just another one's just come through. Um, Elliot, a bit more of an operation, um, operation question here in terms of um, crowd control um, and how we managed our risk assessments um, for operating in populous areas. Did you want to go through a little bit more about that? I can touch on that one briefly, yeah. Uh, I guess um, we made sure that we were sampling at times a day where there weren't huge amounts of people around. Um, we utilised a couple of people to just, you know, um, liaise with anyone who was going to be in the area and just ask them to stay, you know, outside that 30 metre radius of the drone. Um, I guess it will be quite subjective to the area that you're sampling and, and um, you know, uh, your standard operating procedures, but um, that's basically how we did it. We just had a couple of people to, um, you know, um, keep people away from the area while we were launching and landing. Um, we also had some signs um, which basically explained that there was a drone operation in progress as well. And you can see that we were all wearing the high vis um, equipment there. So um, yeah, but if you've got any more specific um, questions there, we'd be happy to, to address them offline. Um, I guess from a risk assessment point of view as well, we did have um, a pretty detailed risk assessment um, that was you know, looking at all of the usual drone operation considerations and then you know, also factoring in all the, the kinds of things that you'd see in a, in a water sampling environment, particularly um, when we were operating in the, in the marine environment there. Um, so yeah, obviously one of the big threats around the coast is um, bird life. So always keeping a good eye out. Um, Touchwood, I haven't had too many issues with eagles yet though. Fantastic, thanks. I've got another question here about um, maximum wind speeds and operational wind speeds. Obviously we're operating the drone within um, the um, within the confines of what the Matrice 600 can, but are we making any special um, considerations for winds with this payload? Uh, look, not 
specifically, um, the system's rated for um, a, a maximum wind resistance of eight meters a second. So um, it's a little bit lower than some of the other um, platforms that are on the market. Um, I guess if you are looking to operate in a particularly windy environment, then it might be that there are other options available. Um, there are some aircraft that do have particularly high wind um, resistant ratings. So um, it does come down to you know your specific requirements. Um, Thank you, Elle. And um, look, what we'll do is we'll probably pull up stumps there for today, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you all for, um, for joining us and hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I'd like to thank Elliot and Guy. Um, thanks, Elliot. And thanks, Guy. It's a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and um, if anyone does have any questions or queries, please feel free to reach out, um, info at spheredrones.com.au or alternatively, just give us a buzz. Um, we've more than happy to answer any questions um, that you might be interested in. Um, and I know, um, that I've got the team and the team that sit within our business are able to answer them for you. So, um, like I said, hope you enjoyed today. And if there are any questions, feel free to shoot out and um, hope you wish you all the best and hope you're all safe and well. So thank you very much. Have a great day and we'll see you at the next Sphere Drones webinar. Thank you.